And uh, this is the result of the work done with um, Goran Malic. He's uh, been a postdoc with, uh, in my group for a while. And um, it was good to have the pandemic to be able to sit down and write this all. Anyway, so the title is Combinatorial Resultants in the Algebraic Rigidity Matroid. And while the rigidity is the common theme that everybody recognizes, I'm not sure about the rest. So I'll go slowly. I'm going to start, whoops, okay. Now, what is this doing? Okay, excuse me. I guess I have to be, one second. This is weird. Uh, strange. Let me stop share. Oh, okay. It's working. I don't know why. I don't know about the delay. I don't know why. And oh, sorry. I need to stop sharing. So it looks like it's it is it has a mind of its own. Okay. I'm going to try again. So can you see it now? Can you no. see anything? No, no, no it's just you. Yeah. Okay, so I, I heard no, right? Okay, so I need to do something else. It's, it's strange because I used it before, but I used it with a different Zoom where I was the one controlling it. So it looks like there is a different uh, thing right now. Excuse Christoph, me? you could make Ileana a co-host if that might help. Um, I can. Um, the settings are that anyone can share their screen. So, okay. and she she was sharing before. So, um, yeah, I was sharing. It's just that yeah. I did not. Okay. I could not control it. So for some reason, let's see if it works now. Yeah, you're back. So, what's going on? Make sure you. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay. So. <laughs> So the, um, I'm, I'm going to start with the motivation and I'll tell you how we get from the localization problem to circuit polynomials, which is the main topic with under, behind this big title. So the localization problem is the following. You are given a graph and you are given some positive weights on its edges and you want to find the placement of the vertices and I'm going to work, uh, everything will be in the plane. So that the edge length match the given weights, right? So that's a standard, a classical problem, very well studied. Here are some graphs and you recognize from the rigidity point of view, there are some differences. I give you some weights and, uh, and what do we know about it, right? So we can solve the localization problem in principle. What does it mean? Well, here's an approach. You set up a system of quadratic equations, the unknowns being the Cartesian coordinates, and write the conditions that the edges match the given length so that the possible placements are among the real solutions of this system. Rigidity theory can help predict a priori whether the set of solutions will be discrete if the graph will be rigid or continuous if the graph is flexible. And in the rigid case, we may run the Grubner basis algorithm, the double exponential Grubner basis algorithm in principle to eliminate, let's say, all but one of the variables. And once we get a polynomial in a single variable, then we can use numerical methods to solve it. Then we select one of the solutions, we substitute it and repeat until we get all the, all the uh, solutions, all the coordinates. Yeah, so that's in principle. Let me talk about a slightly, <laughs> apparently simpler problem. So I'm going to uh, call it the single unknown distance problem. As before, we are given a graph. Also, we have positive weights on its edges. Positive will not matter too much from now on. It's just the motivation comes from here. And what we want to find is all the possible values of a single unknown distance. Yeah, so this is the graph and this is the distance. And you recognize the given graph with the edge weights are, is a Laman graph 
and uh, we just ask what is what are the possible values for this length okay and uh, if we are able to solve this problem then we can solve the localization problem by constructing a, a trilateration so that's the uh, motivation problem and let's see what could we do about this problem again in principle here's how we could solve it so this time we're going to use scaly coordinates namely the coordinate now our coordinates are not the Cartesian coordinates, but the square distances between points. And using a bunch of theorems, and that will be the part of the later in the talk, from distance geometry, rigidity, matroid theory, we reduce the problem to finding a certain irreducible polynomial in the Cayley Menger ideal. And this is called the circuit polynomial. Now it's a polynomial in these variables, the, the, this, the unknown distances. And uh, the support of a polynomial corresponds to a graph. Yes, so each variable corresponds to an edge in the graph. So the support of, of this circuit polynomial corresponds to a circuit in the rigidity matroid. So now if we substitute the given edge length in that circuit polynomial, we get a univariate polynomial which can be solved for the unknown distance. Yeah, so again, this is in principle. So here's an example. So the given graph, it's a, a minimally rigid graph. It's a collection of triangles. And if I place one edge here, you see my mouse, do you? Is my mouse yes. busy? Yes. yes. OK, yeah, so, it is. good. So if we place this edge here, we have one small circuit. If we place it here, we have a slightly larger circuit. If we place it here, we have a circuit that spans the entire graph. and. Um, that is uh, what we need. If we find the circuit polynomial of that particular circuit, then we can find the possible values of that particular distance. OK, so that's the motivating problem. So here's our main problem. <laughs> so the main problem is now, given a rigidity circuit, compute its corresponding circuit polynomial. OK, so that was the motivation. But this is the problem that uh, this talk is about. It's not about the other problems. So here's an example. That's the smallest possible one. It's the tetrahedron K4. This is its circuit polynomial. And variables x, i, j correspond to unknowns, right? Unknowns are, correspond to edges of the graph. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the possible uh, supports of the circuits and the, uh, ver the edges of, uh, of the complete graph. So the support of this particular graph are these variables and as you see they correspond to all the edges and um, then we can use the circuit polynomial to solve the single unit distance problem right okay here's how we do is in this polynomial you substitute values for all the variables except the unknown one so let's say that we want to find the distance between uh, vertices one and four we look at all the positions of one, four, we see the polynomial is of degree two. So yes, it has two solutions, trivial. We know that, we knew that already, nothing new here. So let's see how tractable is the problem of finding a circuit polynomial. In principle, again, we can use the double exponential time Grevner basis algorithm with an elimination order. And this is important. So in practice, Grevner basis algorithms work with lexicographic orders with various um, uh, orders, but with an elimination order, they reportedly, they don't behave well. And so we wanted to verify this and we tried a few examples. The largest we could do with the Grubner basis function in Mathematica took uh, five days and six hours. In all other cases, the execution timed out or crashed. So our goal was to make such calculations more tractable by taking advantage of structural information that is inherent in this problem. So let's see. Here are our, our results. First of all, we have a new algorithm to compute a circuit polynomial with a known support. Yes, the support will be circuits in the sense of rigidity. And uh, our algorithm re relies on resultant-based elimination steps. So we'll do elimination, but not with Grubner basis. We do it with resultants. But that the result, the elimination is guided by a novel inductive construction for rigidity circuits. Yeah, so I guess from for this audience, for the rigidity people, especially from the combinatorial point of view, this is the most attractive part. Novel inductive construction. 
And uh, now we also implemented the algorithms and uh, let's see what we, what we got. So the only previously known circuit polynomial to the best of our knowledge, we searched through the literature everywhere. I'll, by the way, I'm going to give references towards the end. I just want to introduce the problem first. So the only previously known circuit polynomial is for the K4 circuit, we've seen it. It has four vertices, the polynomial has 22 terms. There is no need to compute it because it's already a generator of the Cayley-Menger ideal. What we obtain in practice computationally, we obtain all circuits with five and six vertices, a few with seven. And the largest we could get has something like two million terms. So uh, here are the circuits on six vertices. Let's give them some name. This is the 2D double banana. This is a wheel. This is the Desar graph plus one extra edge, and that's the K33 plus one extra edge. So I call them Desar plus one, K33 plus one. And these are our results, right? So we put here for those where we could run Grebner, just for, for you to, to see the difference. Uh, and uh, this is with the Grebner basis in Mathematica. And we had a strong computer. I'm not claiming that we have the fastest computer in the world, but we ran the, uh, the algorithm on the same computer. And um, it was, um, uh, the details are in the paper, but it's, it's a, it was a very recent and very powerful computer. And uh, we, you can start seeing the difference already. So you see how the number of terms grows very dramatically. This is the homogeneous degree of the polynomial. The polynomials are homogeneous and that's the largest we could compute. So this one is five days, six hours. And it has 600 plus terms and our algorithm solved it in 40 seconds. So we were very proud of this. Then we tried to compute K33 plus one and there we ran into uh, a lot of um, challenges. And uh, if I have the time, I'll tell you about some of them because that requires an extension of our method. And, um, uh, but uh, today I'm going primarily to focus on, on what is, because a lot of this is, it's completely new. So here's an overview of what I want to talk about. First of all, I want to talk about this new concept, the combinatorial resultant of two rigidity circuits. That's a construction. It's a step that, to the best of my knowledge, of our knowledge, it has not been invented before. Then we have a combinatorial theorem. So we prove the existence of an inductive construction of rigidity circuits based on combinatorial resultants. So every circuit can, has, a com, has a construction uh, with this operation. Then, and that's the bulk of the, of the paper, the algebraic theorems. So we have, based on this method, now we have an algorithm, right? So we have an algorithm for computing the circuit polynomial. Based on the inductive construction, we, we use it as a blueprint for applying Sylvester resultants. But there are a number of tricks along the way. So we combine with polynomial factorization, ideal membership, I'll tell you more along the way. So the method, it's faster but still exponential. We cannot expect anything else, even the polynomial uh, explode. So, but it provides structural insights into algebraic elimination problems in the Cayley-Menger ideal. And probably for this workshop, we'll have a lot of interesting open questions. Okay, so that's the plan. Okay, so let's get started. Um, there is a lot to cover in order to just to explain the terminology. So the rigidity theory, I'm going to assume mostly that people in the audience know, except here and there, I may mention a word and explain it. I'll, uh, I'll probably introduce everything and give the definitions in the end. So I'm introducing everything um, informally, but this is what you'll hear about, about the Cayley-Menger ideal, about matroid theory, not just in the sense of combinatorial rigidity or linear um, matroid, or, but uh, mostly about the algebraic matroid. We'll talk about algebraic matroids defined by a prime ideal and the connection with uh, elimination theory, resultant, Grebner basis, and so on. So let's start with the rigidity, combinatorial rigidity part and introduce this new concept, the combinatorial resultant of two rigidity circuits, okay? So let's look at a few small circuits. For n equals four, we have just the tetrahedron. For n equals five, we have the wheel. And then there are the four with the six vertices. 
So as graphs, all of them are three connected except the double banana, which is three connected, but it can be decomposed into, um, it, sorry, it's two connected, but can be decomposed into uh, three connected components. So let's look at this operation first. So this is a special case. It's uh, two sum, the two sum of, uh, of, in general, of two graphs. I'll demonstrate it for circuits. So here we have two tetrahedra. And the operation of two sum consists in selecting one edge in each of them and identifying it. So in other words, that you view the two, two graphs sharing uh, the two vertices and the edge between them. And then I'm eliminating that edge. So that's the two sum operation, okay? So here are some facts well known. The two sum of two circuits is a circuit and the inverse operation, the operation by which I take uh, uh, um, graph that is two connected and split it in the, by essentially bringing back, splitting it into parts and bringing back that edge is called the two split. So when you do a two split of a circuit, you get a pair of circuits. When you do a two sum of two circuits, you get a circuit. So um, a, a three connected, um, a circuit that is not three connected can be decomposed into three connected pieces. So this is an example. So we have here a big one and we do a two sum here and the two sum here and we have three pieces that each of them is three connected. So now we have to focus on the three connected pieces. And we already know uh, something about this. This is the famous uh, inductive construction for circuits of um, Berg and Jordan. Uh, and after you split in three connected components, the three connected circuits admit, admit an inductive construction via Hennerberg two extensions. This is just illustrating the step, yeah. So beautiful. So we actually wanted to use this example. And uh, the problem is with the uh, Hennerberg two extensions is that we do not know how to find the circuit polynomial of the Hennerberg extension. So our goal, however, is to find an inductive construction that has a direct algebraic interpretation. Okay, so that's, that's the goal. So we are getting something different from Bergen Jordan with a different operation. And our operations have a direct algebraic interpretation. That's the result. So we define the combinatorial resultant actually as a generalization of the two sum. So let's see how it goes. So let's take a small case. This is the smallest case that is not, uh, that is three connected, right? So it cannot be obtained via two sums. So let's obtain this one via our operation and then I'll define it formally. So we start with two K4 circuits. It has to be something smaller, right? So, and there are only K4s. But this time, instead of identifying one edge in each and, and considering that to be the common part, we assume that they have a common triangle. And in this common triangle, we choose to eliminate one of the common edges. Yeah, so that's what we do. We, these graphs now put them together, eliminate that, edge and here you go. We obtain the wheel of four, on four. Okay, so let's uh, look at the general case. So the operation of course can be defined on graphs in general. We have two graphs. They overlap in at least one edge. So the graphs are on sets of vertices. They don't completely overlap as vertex sets. They have some something in common and uh, on the common part there is one edge that you eliminate, okay? So the combinatorial resultant of two circuits viewed as edge, as collections of edges, you take the union of edges and delete the common edge E, okay? And the beauty of this is that the combinatorial resultant has a direct algebraic interpretation. It is the, uh, the Sylvester resultant of two polynomials. What is it doing? Um, I, I, I'm not going to go too much into the details of the algebraic elimination, but the idea is you have a poly, you have two polynomials, and the Sylvester resultant is the determinant in terms of the coefficients of uh, of the uh, polynomial, right? So the variable that we are eliminating, we are eliminating the variable in those two polynomials. In other words, so it is so exactly. Are you, are you asking anything other than overlap on one edge, like? For the vertex overlap, do all the edges have to agree or something like this? 
wait, wait, wait a little bit. Yeah. So, so far, I'm not asking anything. I'm just defining it. Yeah. So I'll get uh, a little better on for conditions under which we want to have something interesting happening. But so far, nothing. Right. So think about uh, the um, having two polynomials with arbitrary number of variables, right? You select, there is a common variable in the two of them and you want to eliminate that variable. So that variable, all the other variables go into the coefficients and the coefficients go into the Sylvester polynomial. You take the determinant, you get a polynomial without the variable that we want to eliminate. That's the idea, yeah? And this works in general. But for graphs, that's the interpretation. So I'll tell you more in a moment. So let's see. So far, operation is general, graphs. Let's see what happens for circuits because that's our goal. Yeah, we, we want to understand what is happening with circuits. So now we take two rigidity circuits, C1 and C2. They overlap on at least one edge. We define the combinatorial resultant in the same way. And we ask under what conditions is the combinatorial resultant resultant of two circuits, also a circuit. Yeah, so that's the question. That's, and, and here we'll come up with some conditions, okay? Okay, so let's see. That's, that, by the way, this is an open question. Uh, in full generality, it's an open question. But here we have a lemma. And, uh, and that would be enough for what we want to do. You'll see in a moment. So, if the intersection of the two circuits is a Laman graph, if and only if, right? Then the combinatorial resultant of two rigidity circuits is a Laman plus one graph. So we have a condition, but it's not sufficient. So let me give you some examples. So first of all, remind everybody, even graduate students, uh, I know this has been beaten to death, but remind everybody a Laman graph is a two, three sparse graph, and uh, these are the minimally rigid graphs and rigidity circuits are two, three sparse on subsets, but the total number of edges is two, 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 two and minus two, yeah? And that's the terminology comes from the rigidity matroid. The basis are the Raman graphs. We have independent, dependent, and circuits, the minimally dependent ones, which are defined as above. And the Laman plus one graph, it's one graph that you obtain by adding exactly one edge to a Laman graph. And this graph contains exactly one rigidity circuit on possibly a smaller set of vertices. But, but that's what you get. You get a Laman plus one graph, yeah? So these are, this is the condition that it's here. So if you have two circuits and they overlap on a Laman graph, if they don't overlap on the Laman graph, you cannot even get a Laman, uh, if you don't, if they don't overlap on Laman graph, then you, you don't even get a Laman plus one graph. And the circuit is a Laman plus one graph that spans everything. Yeah, so the open question is, when is it always a circuit? So let me give you two examples. We call this a circuit invalid combinatorial resultant. We take a combinatorial resultant of these two graphs, a wheel and a K4, and I overlay them so that the overlap is in this Laman graph that is two triangles, yeah? And I eliminate this edge and that's the result. So the result has a circuit here and, and uh, Hennerberg one here, so it's a Laman plus one that is not a circuit. Yeah, so the operation always gives a Laman plus one, but not necessarily a circuit. And here's another one, we call it circuit valid combinatorial resultant. So in this case, we have, in fact, the same operands, the wheel and the K4, but this time the overlap is just on one triangle and we eliminate this edge and the result is a wheel of five which is a circuit, okay? So I promised that there will be a lot of interesting open questions. So let me start with the first one is we have a condition, a necessary condition, but is not, uh, is not sufficient for the, so the goal is to find necessary and sufficient conditions for the combinatorial resultant of two circuits to be a circuit. So just give me conditions. Yeah, so that when you put them together, you always get a circuit. But it turns out that for our purposes, we will not even need that. And there will be more uh, 
more, pro more open problems soon. So let's move on to what we have proven. So our first result, the combinatorial theorem, call it, we proved the existence of an inductive construction for rigidity circuits based on the combinatorial resultants. Yeah, so what does it say? So let's read it slowly. Each rigidity circuit can be obtained by applying combinatorial resultant operation starting from K4 circuits. The construction is captured by a binary resultant tree whose nodes are intermediate rigidity circuits and whose leaves are K4 graphs, right? So here we start from K4. You cannot see the, the labels, but uh, I'll, I'll go into more detail uh, in the next image, but I want to illustrate that a tree it's not, <clears throat> it's not linear as a Henneberg two or Henneberg operation. So it's, it's a tree of possibilities. These two wheels uh, are different. Uh, so this is a construction of the, uh, what is this? The uh, K33 plus one, yeah. A circuit from two wheels of four, which themselves are constructed from uh, each one from two K fourth. So first of all, the resultant tree is not unique. So this is the construction that I've shown you before. And each operation, actually, you have to specify not just the graphs that enter, but actually the labeling on the vertices so that you know what is in common and what is the edge that you eliminate. So in this case, the two six is eliminated. So the operation is uh, with a, a label here, what you eliminate among the part that is in common. So here's one way of obtaining the K33 uh, plus one. This is one tree. This is another tree. This is more linear, right? So construct add K4. This is another one, much bigger. Yeah, so it's not unique. There are many such trees. And um, I'm going to tell you the proof. <laughs> Actually, let me give you an overview. So of course, yeah, it's an induction. So for the inductive step, we use an adaptation of a weaker lemma from Bergen Jordan's proof that a three connected circuit, uh, a three connected circuit has a, a inverse Henneberg step, but one lemma in their paper says that a three connected circuit has at least two non-adjacent degree three vertices on which an inverse Henneberg two operation can be performed. So we, we are using this lemma, but in fact, we, use an, we need something even weaker than that, which makes the algorithms a little faster. Yeah. So let me explain that. So the proof comes in the next slides. So this is the essence, right? So let's go slowly. We have a circuit, three connected circuit with uh, N plus one more than five vertices. Then in polynomial time, we can find two circuits A and B, such that A has just one fewer vertex. B can have at least one less, right? May, may have fewer. So one of them is exactly one fewer vertex, the other may be smaller. And C can be represented as the combinatorial resultant of A and B. Okay, and the proof is in these two pictures. So let me explain that. So this is our circuit C. And according to Berg and Jordan, we can find two vertices of degree three, non-adjacent. So that if you do, you, you can do a, an inverse Henneberg operation. In fact, we are going to use, to do the Henneberg operation only on this red vertex. And that's what is uh, presented here. So. On this graph, we do an inverse Henneberg on this vertex, on the red vertex. So we remove the three edges and we place this edge back. And the result is a circuit. And this is our circuit A. Yeah, so one of them comes directly an inverse Henneberg according to Berg and Jordan. The other, we use the fact that we have another vertex of degree three that is not adjacent with this one. So this is the, that's, here's how we will obtain the blue uh, circuit. We remove the three, ver uh, three edges incident to the blue vertex. And we keep the edge that was added in the previous construction. So right, remember, we had to put a, a red edge back to get the red circuit. So we keep it. 
we keep this uh, uh, okay we keep the this uh, red edge so when we remove these three edges the result is a Laman graph because it was a circuit right so I'm removing three edges from a circuit so the result is a Laman graph and I am adding one edge so I'm obtaining a Laman plus one graph that spans a unique circuit and that would be my blue circuit okay and you can verify that the combinatorial resultant of this red and blue produce exactly the original circuit. So that's the that's the construction. That's the proof. Any questions? Okay. So let me move on then. Oh, let me let me give you some open questions here because there are many. So I add it to the first one. Uh, first, we'd like to have. Necessary. So the construction goes backwards, right? So we know that there is a way. In fact, there are many ways because the vertices of degree three, there may be several of them. So even inverse, inverse re, uh, combinatorial resultant constructions are many trees. You can choose whatever you, it's convenient. But we'd like something to go bottom up. And for that, we will need some necessary and sufficient conditions. When can we combine these two graphs? In what way? Well, we know we need a, a common Laman graph, but uh, how can we combine them so that we get a circuit without much ado? Uh, so um, that's the first problem. The other problems are all related to the algorithm. So the algorithm, each step, each inductive step, it's relatively easy to obtain it. Yeah, so it's a combination of, you know, pebble games, whatever. So it is, it's easy to do the, um, uh, the uh, combinatorial step. But overall, because the tree can be balanced, so let me go back a little bit just to look here. Yeah, so this is an example. The tree in principle could be balanced. It means that you might have to do an exponential number of steps. Right? So the length, because the construction drops just one vertex at each step, in principle, the uh, height of the tree can be linear. And if it is balanced, it is exponential. But the punchline is that we don't have such examples except for the trivial one that I have shown you. So here are some questions. Can you find non-trivial infinite families of balanced or not even balanced exponential size resultant combinatorial resultant trees uh, if not characterize the circuits obtained by the worst case size of the combinatorial resultant trees we don't know how how big the tree is and that will give the overall complexity of the algorithm right so we want to refine the time complexity for the algorithm and um, if not analyze and find bounds on the number of combinatorial resultant trees, because sometimes you may want to get one that is better than the other. Remember, this is the cheap step. This is the combinatorial step. The expensive step is the com computation of the resultant. And I'll show you in a moment, that's where the difficulty comes. But if we could at least understand the correlation between the combinatorial step and the algebraic step better, we might you know, simplify a lot these horrendous calculations that are involved in computing these polynomials. So I leave you to these uh, combinatorial problems. I'll get back to them in the end for further questions. So let's move on now to the algebraic theorem. Okay, so now we want to use this inductive construction as a blueprint for applying the Sylvester resultants. So we will now start at the bottom and work our way up to the circuit because we know we eliminate variables and uh, eventually we'll get there. But how, yeah? Can we guarantee that we get circuits all throughout? So let's see, here's the algorithm. So let me walk you over the algorithm. So the input um, is, so the algorithm just for one step of the result and not for the whole inductive part, right? So it depends on the size of the tree, but just one step, let's do one step. So the input is given by two, uh, two circuits and an edge in such a way that a given that the combinatorial resultant of A and B by eliminating the edge E is a circuit. And we are given the circuit polynomials for A and for B, and we are given the elimination variable E. 
and the output, we want to obtain this circuit polynomial for C. So the first step is, of course, compute the resultant. We already eliminated. The problem is that uh, the, the polynomial may not be irreducible. If it is irreducible, we are done. That's exactly the circuit polynomial return it. By the way, I'm going to talk about the theory uh, if I have the time towards the end. So, but right now I just present the algorithm. So if it is irreducible, return. In some of the cases, we got it immediately. In some other cases, no. Yeah, so here's a question. Under what conditions on the circuits A and B and given the uh, circuit polynomial, is it guaranteed that the resultant actually is irreducible? I have no idea. Yeah. So more experimentation is required in order to even formulate a conjecture here. Um, good. So this is the first question. Identify conditions so that the resultant is, ir is irreducible. It, it, if it is irreducible, then it is the circuit polynomial. Otherwise, you have to factor the polynomial, factorize it. And we have examples where this is necessary, even in, in the ca calculation that we carried out. So we factorize. Good, so now you have uh, at least one of these factors will be your circuit polynomial. We know that because the resultant will be in the ideal. So the circuit polynomial will be there, but how can we get rid of the others? So here's a simple case when you can get rid of the others. Some of these factors will have support that is a strict subset of the support of the circuit. And circuit is minimal dependent in the ideal. So anything with a, a support smaller than that is independent. So it's not in the ideal, you can get rid of it. Yeah, so that's another simple case. So here's the, the fact is that in all of our examples, the extra factors had smaller support. We didn't have to examine. The rest of the algorithm is just conjectural. We don't know whether we'll have to do anything beyond this. So uh, of course, these are discarded, as I said, because they are not in the ideal. So we, we, we don't know. This is another open question. Under what condition? Or is, it, is this true? So since we don't know that, we need to get the algorithm all the way to the end. What can we do? Oops. So, um, oh yeah, yeah, so sorry. I hear, I, I wanted to uh, put the open problem immediately. So we, wa uh, we want, who wants to work on this? So identify conditions for the resultant of two circuit polynomials to have exactly one factor that is supported on the combinatorial resultant circuit. One factor up to multiplicity, yes because the others are immediately eliminated. And again, it's very easy. Module of the factorization, which is not a trivial operation itself. And, uh, and the punchline is that, as I said, we did not encounter examples where this was false, but um, uh, if, if this is true, then you return the unique factor supported on C. Otherwise you still have to continue, right? So what can we do? Well, then let's say that we have some factors that are on the same support and some of them, one of them may be in the ideal, the others may be extra factors, right? So we want to get rid of the others. The only way you could proceed, you can apply an ideal membership test. And this is still Grubner basis. However, it's not Grubner basis with elimination, it's with any order and in principle should work faster, yeah? So this is the algorithm. And here are some of the remaining questions and they, are, they seem to be very hard, but uh, we hope that the Grebner basis community, which is very active and large and have uh, beautiful tools and computers beyond what we had access to, uh, may uh, be interested in working on such problems. So besides the two problems that I mentioned before, we like to identify conditions for the resultant of the circuits, circuit polynomials to have more than one factor, right? Each one up to multiplicity. That's how we count them, supported on the combinatorial resultant. At least one example. <laughs> We'd like to see one example. We have not seen it. And in this case, only one of them is the circuit polynomial. But if you find one example, it means that our algorithm has to go all the way to the end. And at least that puts it in a different category of complexity.
Okay, so let's see. So now uh, I am, uh, oh, I have good time. So then, okay. Any questions so far? Because if not, I'm going to tell you about the underlying theory. Yeah, I do have a question. Yes. So, it, so what is the best upper bound that you know for your algorithm? If the complexity, you know, if, if all the steps are needed, have you worked it out? Uh, yes. So uh, there is a formula in our paper where we look at the, uh, there is a, um, we look at the growth in the degree of the uh, resultant. So it's a homogeneous degree and we have some bounds we found in the literature bounds on the on the degree that uh, is obtained. So we have something. It's obviously exponential. I, I cannot tell you in detail exponentially in this and this because there are so many factors involved here. But obviously I said from the very beginning, it's still exponential, but it is guided by something that you know where it leads. You are not doing a, a, a huge search like the Grebner basis does, right? Sure, so, I mean, but is it simply exponential? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I, we did not analyze it to that level of detail because everything that we could find was in the literature on, you know, it, it, puts, together, uh, it puts together algorithms of other people, right? So if we want to do factorization, if we want to do Grubner basis with it, if, yeah, if in the end you have to apply everything, you'll have to use Grubner basis for the ideal membership, right? So then Grubner basis is double exponential. Yes, so. Okay, so, so we're back in the sort of thing where Grubner basis basically doesn't work on real problems, but people say that if you sacrifice a chicken and use the right term order, it will work in practice. Yes, exactly. And, and here's the term order is essential. The term order is what, so what we do with the, um, okay. So um, yes, exactly. So the, uh, the ideal membership is not, the, uh, the elimination order is a bad one, right? So that's, it's double exponential. It, it seems to require double exponential time, right? So- yeah, and uh, I've the, also tried, believe me, I agree with this. Yes, okay. So anyway, we can have a long conversation on this because we have tried for at least, well, a long time. And everything that we are talking about has been computed. Whatever we have been able to compute is on a GitHub and all the polynomials that we computed are there. It's huge, it's just storing one of them. So I'll, I'll get back to the table later with this fresh view, uh, but um, yeah, so <laughs> yeah. Diana, I have, I have a couple of questions. Yes, Mira. Um, first, the algebraic question. So you get this um, polynomial, which is potentially not irreducible. So in other words, it's reducible, oh, but no. you said, that most of the time uh, all the other factors except for one are supported on smaller than the circuit so you can throw them away. Um, but have you ever seen a case where that's not the, uh, the situation that you actually get something that's reducible that, that uh, more than one factor is supported on the no, circuit? That, that's an open problem. That's what we listed. We listed it an open problem. We, we did not encounter such examples. And yeah. so you never have to get to that ideal membership step at no. all because the no. remain. Yeah, we did not. But remember, we could only compute a few of them because if you want, I can get you back to, to the table. It's back in the beginning. So just so that you, you see what we were able to compute in practice, right? So give me a second. Okay, here it is. That's what we oh, those are the ones. Yeah. These are the ones, right? So look, the larger, so the last two are are uh, are two sums. So these are the easiest one. Two sum is is uh, reasonable, <laughs> I would say. You have a chance there. So, but the largest we could get was two million something. This is the largest, K33 plus one. 
we could not get it with this method that I'm describing. We had to do something else. That's for another talk. So this is, I, I don't want, it's too technical to describe it here, right? So, and this is with Grubner basis, it took five days. We computed it with Grubner, no, with the, the Zarg, the K33 plus one, we could not compute it with Grubner basis. The computer crashed after 40 days or something. But even with the, with the resultant, we had to improve on our method in order to compute it. And when we managed to compute it, it took you know that many seconds yeah mm -hmm. so and it has something like a million terms so this one which has also about a million terms but it was in 38 seconds compared to this one so you see the difference right so this is not necessarily only on the on the number of terms this is the homogeneous degree and the, you expect this to be worse but in fact it was faster so it's the structure the structure of the circuit. So if you have this construction, the individual steps can be computed with a result and relatively reasonably. Okay. Then okay. the other second question is on the combinatorial part. Okay. Um, so are you able to get your, I mean, I'm not exactly sure at this point how you define uh, the optimal kind of what we call the DR plan, the equivalent of that. Um, uh, but... Uh, how do you? What is the DR plan? It, it, so it this has... this a tree that you have. Yes, except it's with circuits. We have yeah. rigid objects. We have circuits. Yeah. Um, so do you know how to get the optimal one? No, that's another open question, right? So. so uh, yeah, I, I couldn't yes. figure out what you meant by optimal. So optimal is depth. I didn't say optimal, right? So uh -huh. I said let's analyze it. So essentially, there is these things are correlated with your goal. So if you only want to compute the trees, you define combinatorial, you define it the way you want. You can, the depth is going to be, it, it can be less than N because uh, for instance, if you think about the two sum, the two sum splits in, uh, can split it into parts that are half of the number of edges. So the tree doesn't have to have N. Right. right. It's our construction, however, uh, goes one vertex down. So in our, construction the, the what, what we proved uh, in this inductive construction the death is going to be n what we don't know it can be the death end but it may be a very skinny n right so this is this is a skinny path where at every step you make the resultant of a larger circuit plus a k4 and that is essentially a path right so mm -hmm. in some sense this could be the ideal but the challenge here is that we do not know exactly the correlation between the combinatorial resultant and the resultant calculation. So some of them may produce good uh, polynomials that you don't have to factor. So, you know, there are so many open questions here. Keep in mind, this is completely new. I'm not aware of anybody doing this work. It's just we propose a lot of open questions because we don't have time to work on all of them. So I think it's a very rich, um, uh, collection of uh, I, of problems because it's something both on the combinatorics on the uh, algebraic and there is a very interesting relationship between the two. Yeah, um, so, so you, you your, your you definition want. there is no combinatorial definition of what is optimal. It's some at the moment. Not at the moment. Not at yeah. the moment. Okay. Because, yeah. Number one is that even the even. Uh, Number one is that we also need a few more examples and even enlarging this collection of examples is very time consuming. So maybe the people in, uh, in Linz that have the, the best Grubner basis software, they could help and compute more than and, and other people, right? So there are a lot of groups in Europe that have extraordinarily fast and, uh, can, uh, and uh, super, um, uh, optimized uh, uh, algorithms uh, for computing this. So if we could get a few more examples, that would be fantastic, right? It, it's, that's all we, we were able to compute. So it's a, take it is, is setting the foundations. We have the theory laid out. We have variations on the algorithm. And then the rest is experimental work to collect more data in order to check whether some of these things are true or not. It can maybe can be proved by counter examples or maybe needs a theorem. So it's a lot of work. So what we are presenting here is not closed work. It's rather the beginning of a lot of work that can possibly be done by um, many other people. And uh, I think it's suitable for the topic of this workshop. Okay. 
Okay, thanks. So let me uh, go to the last part. I want a little bit there because that's the only part where I get a chance to give some credits to people. And uh, uh, very quickly, let me do a background tour of, so what are the things, right? So uh, algebraic rigidity matroid, it gets into the title and it's essential in everything. What is it? It's the algebraic matroid defined by the Cayley-Menger ideal. And the Cayley-Menger ideal is the, it's a prime ideal, but it's the ideal generated by the five by five minors of the Cayley matrix. That's the first concept we need. So we need to talk about the Cayley-Menger ideal first. So that's the Cayley matrix is the matrix of uh, distances, square distances between points for n points in Euclidean space. And Cayley's theorem says that if the distances come from n points, then the rank of the matrix is at most d plus two. So meaning that all five by five mi uh, minors must vanish if we are in dimension two. And these are the generators of the Cayley-Menger idea. That's, that's our starting point. So if you want to do Grubner basis, the first thing you do, you, you get these uh, polynomials and that's your ideal and then do all the calculations from there. So the, um, um, uh, uh, important part is that uh, it is a prime ideal, right? So the support of a polynomial corresponds to a graph. The ideal is prime and prime ideal ideals induce algebraic matroids. So let's see what these are, right? So um, we talk about um, algebraic and linear matroids and combinatorial matroids. What I mean here are graph matroids, matroids of a, a, a collection of edges. And uh, the uh, algebra in a if you you have an algebraic matrix of a prime ideal, the dependent sets are supports of polynomials in the ideal, and the independent ones are those for which no polynomial in the ideal is supported by them. Right, so that's why we could eliminate some of the factors that were not supported by the uh, by the edges of the circuit. So the circuit polynomials are polynomials with minimal support and these supports are exactly the circuits. Of course, this needs a proof, yes. And uh, here it's a famous uh, result of Lovas and Dres from 87 that the circuit polynomials are essentially unique. Essentially means up to multiplication by, by a scalar. So um, now I wanted to point out here that matrix theory, when it started, it started with the algebraic ones, right? So it's van der Verden, and then there was a theorem by Ingleton and Main. And then if we put all this together with the uh, Cayley and Laman and various folklore things, we get that in the rigidity case, these, uh, uh, these matrix are isomorphic, but we didn't find anywhere a complete proof. So, you will find in our paper also, we redid some of these proofs and we included the complete ones just for completeness. We didn't find anywhere in the literature except little uh, references to, uh, to paper. So we put it together in the case of the rigidity matrix just for the uh, community. Then, uh, Lovas and Dres, right? So it's about circuit polynomials and arbitrary polynomial ideas and, and the fact that they are essentially uniquely sub determined by their support. So once you know the support, it's only one polynomial, of course, up to multiplication by a constant in the, in the uh, ring. So anyway, so now about algebraic matroids. So let, let me tell you, so uh, uh, Louis in, is in the audience. So we were inspired by your paper. So you, um, um, uh, by the way, so the topic to the best of our knowledge of a computing circuit polynomials came in the PhD thesis of zeros. And he actually had some Macaulay code for computing uh, circuit polynomials in, a, in an arbitrary ideal. And you can work out a few small examples, but, uh, but they are impractical in the Cayley ideal. No way, that's too big. But the topic was popularized and we, we really liked that paper in Mathematical Monthly last year, um, a paper by uh, uh, Zvi Rosen, uh, Louis Teran and uh, Jessica Sitman. So that's, uh, you know, that triggered uh, um, an interest. And in the end, we connected them with the Cayley uh, and, uh, and got these results, right? Now, 
on elimination theory, there is a huge theory, not much for the Cayley ideal, but you can find in the literature, especially in the robotics kinematics, we, we found the papers, uh, Husti, this group in particular, where people want to get a polynomial so that you plug in your, your specific parameters of your robot and it gets you one of the variables, the value of, of the one that you want. So this idea of getting a single polynomial that you can parameter that is parametric and you can put values can be found in the literature and it's each one of them it's a lot of work right so we have a method for computing uh, one for all the circuits good so that's essentially what i wanted to tell you so there are lots of interesting questions so let me end with the two collections of problems one is combinatorial one is one collection is algebraic this is the reference. Our paper uh, is, has just been accepted at SOCG. And, uh, and that's about it. Yes, and uh, Goran, I don't know if Goran is in the audience. I don't know. Ah, Jessica is in the audience. I see, I, I can't see everybody, but uh, anyway, so that's, uh, uh, that's the end of it. <laughs> Any questions? Thank, thank you, Eliana. Yeah, it's re really interesting. So Goran is there. I can see him on the He's there. Okay, good. Goran, maybe you can say hello. <laughs> yeah, Goran is a postdoc uh, in, in my group. So, so just before I ask people if they want to ask questions, is, is the, the paper on the archive or? or and it will be, yeah, it will be on the archive very soon. <laughs> Great. Yeah, it's it's written. In, in fact, the whole paper is it's it's ready. But we always want one more thing <laughs> to add to it, uh, one more picture. Let's see if the last example that is has been running for 10 days, maybe it's ended and we can add that one, but it's, it's there. Great, thanks. So um, are there any questions for Ileana? Um, sorry, I have a question. Thanks for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, about these different constructions of the circuits. Cannot these different constructions be used to uh, avoid this maybe necessary step of uh, doing this um, membership test because you can then take the greatest common divisor of the of the polynomials if you can construct it in different ways the uh, the, the circuit. Uh, you if you can construct in different ways the circuit. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to understand what you are proposing because this is what we have here is just one step in the tree. Just one, the, the, the algorithm, each algorithm that we presented is focusing on just one step of the construction, right? One step, ah, okay. yeah, one step. And in that step, you have to decide. Okay, not yeah. the, the, the complete one, okay. Yeah. So how large the tree is, it will be how many times you'll have to apply these steps, right? So that that's why there is a combinatorial complexity and there is an algebraic complexity. And the algebraic complexity, we focus it at just one step, one, one node in this tree. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Jessica has her hand up, I think. Hi, Hi Liana, that was a beautiful talk. Um, I have a question about degree bounds. I'm thinking about the ideal membership computations. Like going in, if you know you're t like, do you, if you have two circuit polynomials and you're trying to eliminate, do you have any degree bounds on what you think the new circuit is going to be? Yes, yes, yes. We, we do have the bounds. Uh, I don't, okay. I don't have them memorized and I didn't think about putting them. If, uh, if I had time, I can dig them up in the paper. So we found uh, it's essentially applying a bound on, um, uh, let's see. So the uh, the circuit polynomials are homogeneous, right? Mm -hmm. And then we computed what would be the homogeneous degree of the uh, of the resultant. I see. Yeah. Because and I'm the, wondering, yeah. like the the uh, the Cayley Menger ideal is essentially the ideal of the secant variety of Veronese, and yeah. those resolutions are known. So it must be. I mean, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but people must know the Castle. Castle Mobile Mumford regularity. Yeah. So anyway, these you can there. There's this regularity as a number that that will sort of bound uh, the complexity of computing the ideal membership problem for that ideal. 
Uh, Jessica, Goran raised yeah. the hand. I'm sure Goran knows the answer. Goran, do you want to answer this? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can. I think I can answer this. So we know, given uh, two circuit polynomials, uh, or just given any two homogeneous polynomials, we know exactly uh, the homogeneous degree uh, yes. of the resultant of those two polynomials. Um, okay. However, the the issue more is uh, well, th the main issue is in actually computing the resultant and then factorizing it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we know what will, in, ter in terms of degrees, we know what we'll get. And if, mm -hmm. it's, if it's irreducible, great, then, then, then that's mm -hmm. it. But there are, uh, there are examples where we don't, where we don't get uh, irreducible polynomials. And there, the, the I ideal membership comes in. Uh, because I mean, I guess if you know the degrees you're looking for, you can like terminate these, some of these things earlier. You know what I mean? You can sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and maybe I can quickly comment on, on a question that was before about the optimal tree. Um, if Ileana, if you if you can go to uh, to the table. Um, Yes. With, with yeah. I was trying. I was looking in the paper, trying to get the bound. Uh, yeah. So let me go to the table. Ah, here it is. Okay. So, 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 so the question, if if I if I understood it correctly, was is is there a concept of an optimal? Uh, tree for, for these computations. And um, uh, I, I guess uh, you, you have to sort of uh, settle on, on, on what kind of optimality you're looking for. If you're looking for uh, optimal in the sense of what will get you the circuit polynomial the fastest, then it might be the case that actually a larger tree will be more useful. Uh, so for example, if, if you can go to the table, uh, back to the table, you're scrolling through the paper. Uh, okay, okay. Oh, sorry, so, you saw my, you, yeah, I was trying to find, oh, sorry, I didn't know that it's visible. I was trying to get in the paper, the, um, the bound, I, anyway, yeah. So for example, here in this K33 plus one, this extended resultant. So, so what we did here is we, uh, modified the algorithm slightly so that it uses as many resultant computations with K4 polynomials as possible, because those are the smallest, uh, the, the simplest polynomials in the Kaley-Menger ideal. So the resultant computation with the circuit polynomial of K4 goes smoothly. So you can see this uh, even on the seven vertices. Uh, both computations are with k with k fours. So, uh, but if you were thinking of defining optimal in terms of the smallest tree, then that tree might not have a lot of k fours in it. Uh, so, for example, for the k three three plus one, the smallest tree is the one that. Uh, as uh, on the leaf, on the level of the leaves, it has four K4s. Those combine into two wheels on five vertices. And those two wheels co combine into a K3 plus one. But uh, no matter how hard we tried to compute the resultant of two wheels on five vertices, we couldn't do it. So <laughs> that, that was just too, uh, too much for for very, very strong computers. Okay, we have more questions. Yeah, Jessica, I guess who is next? Luis. Yeah, so, um, so I'm looking at this table and so I guess the other, is K34 not a circuit with seven vertices? So you didn't get K34? 
Which one? K. K three four. Sorry, what is case? Oh, oh, with seven vertices. No, with seven vertices, what you have here are the only ones that we could compute. Yeah, so far. Yeah, so we, uh, this is an ongoing calculation. So it's, uh, we, uh, we can get the trees, the combinatorial trees, but the, the resultant calculation was not completed successfully. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay, got it. Yeah, so the, we did not list here with seven vertices, there are plenty of, uh, of circuits and they are harder, but you see even the simplest ones that we could compute were, were um, to sum and you see how large they are, so yeah. Okay. May I, may I just make one remark that um, I, I thank you very much. This is an absolutely great advertisement for uh, what I wanted to try to get across at my speed talk, because I think this works just the same in three space if you start with K5s. Right, so this is exactly the cycle algebra that I wanted to propose that you take two cycles and what you do know about circuits in general in a matroid is that uh, there are only two axioms that no cycle could should contain one another and if there are two cycles that intersect in anything, then their union minus any element of the intersection contains a cycle. Right, so that, that is the only thing, and Graver in his 1966 paper, which I just republished in the Prime Epsilon Journal because I found it, I wanted to congratulate him on his 85th birthday. So he actually proved that um, a, a little lemma that um, says that if you start out with um, in, incomparable sets and you just make this uh, second cycle axiom work, and then take minimal sets of the new collection you get. Then you get the circuits of a matroid or you get both cycle axioms satisfied and the original collection is among the dependent sets. So that he uses to um, a very nice degree to show for binary matroids this uh, nice, um, thing that uh, if there is a three connected or any three connected graph is uniquely determined by its cycle matroid. And I think those are the, the same uh, things that um, uh, Jordan and Kazanitsky used to show when uh, a graph in 2D is actually uniquely determined by its rigidity matroid. So I think that is very interesting to start with cycles. And I would fearlessly uh, think that if you are actually using um, a sequence of K4s, so attaching a K4 is actually equivalent to one extension. And then using the Burke-Jordan thing to say that any cycle, three connected cycle is um, just obtainable from K4 by a sequence of one extensions that's gluing the K4s together. And so okay. if you have a non-three connected cycle, you take it apart first into its, um, by the reverse two sum, right? So then you can actually- Brigitte, I I, may, may I interrupt for a second? I just want to make sure that we speak the same language. When you say cycle, you mean what we call circuit? Circuit, so rigidity ah. cycle. Okay, or, or circuit, rigidity right? so cir I, I, knew, I, I thought that it's called rigidity circuit. That's uh, so, well, a yeah. That okay. Depends on. <laughs> okay. It gets confusing, <laughs> right? But um, so I think that uh, your algorithm should work fine on the three connected circuits, right? It, Don't you think works. just by sticking K fours on, right? So that it should be clear that you can work yourself up just one vertex at a time. Yeah, I, I don't know what I don't know what you mean. We prove that the algorithm works. So if you have another construction in mind, no, no, I'm, I mean in it, terms it, of uh, in terms of um, uh, depth of the tree. In terms of the depth of the tree, in what sense? Right, that that you know which cycles to actually compute the the. Um, 
But so this is this is the theorem. So the theorem is a construction, and we are not claiming the construction is unique, right? But this is one construction. Okay. It's a proof that it's it can always be done. There are many ways to right. obtain the trees, but I, I don't quite understand. I don't get what your point is. No, I, I think that. It, so then I didn't understand your um, conjecture of what tree to take or what the difficulty is to get the resultants for, for the larger graphs. So the difficulty is algebraic. So there are two problems here. A collection of questions is combinatorial. A collection of problems is algebraic. And the optimality, so Mira asked if we have any idea of what, how we could define the optimal tree. And we said that we didn't get to ask about this. I mean, people, by the way, I think that anybody can make their own optimality depending on the goal. Our goal is maybe not necessarily only combinatorial. Our goal is in the context of the entire problem. And that's what Goran tried to, tried to say was that even if the tree looks better, in fact, the algebraic calculation when you compute the corresponding resultants, it may be more work. So it's the combination of the two that is the encompassing big open question, right? Whether this can mm. be made uh, faster. But we, what we did we, in terms of uh, isolating the problems, we isolated some open questions that remain from our approach on the combinatorial side of this algorithm, of this approach, and some other questions that are on the algebraic side. And, and of course, putting everything together. What I hear from you, you are saying that, yes, so circuits can be obtained in some other ways and we are not, it, it's fine. Yes, it no, will no. be great. So, but, yeah. but what I'm saying is exactly that I proposed for 3D. So you take uh, K5s and do the same thing, exactly yeah. the same thing, right? So I wonder if there's some algebraic method also here because I think that was missing for characterizing 3D rigidity. I, I'm uh, here, uh, I, this, I, I may disagree. Right? Yeah. The, Let me disagree. The of the polynomials. Uh, here I may disagree for the following reason. Uh, everything that we have presented works in dimension two because we have Laman theorem, because we have a combinatorial characterization. So in dimension three, we do not have a combinatorial characterization. Maybe people have some subfamilies where something like this gr uh, grows. In, uh, in work that uh, with Mira we did many years ago, we looked at uh, circuits in dimension three that were not even rigid. So rigidity and circuits in 3D are so much more complex that I don't think it is the same method, no way. Plus the theorems that are underlying this, it's something that I said very late in the talk. So let me get to that slide to, to make it clear. So uh, the fact that, that um, the fact that we have this equivalence that, uh, uh, in the, that the algebraic matroid is isomorphic to the combinatorial matroid is done by a algebraic linear and linear combinatorial. It's via Laman theorem. We do not have a Laman theorem in dimension three. So this cannot be, I, I'm not saying as a plan, it can, it can be pursued, but we miss essential ingredients and we cannot go to dimension three just saying, oh, we do that. Maybe you can do something at the combinatorial level, but I, you cannot guarantee that you'll get exactly the rigidity matroid in 3D. That, so that's my- I think I, I would fearlessly guess that you get the maximal. Uh, the maximal- yeah, I don't know. I don't right. know. So lots of open K5 questions. Are, yeah. In which the K5s are circuits. That's, that's fantastic. So if uh, we manage to trigger uh, thoughts and uh, propose new problems, including problems proposed from the audience, I'm happy because I guess the goal of this workshop was exactly this one. So. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks all of you.